Welcome to the environmental awareness training for the Fire Adapted 50 Phase 1B project. This training was prepared by Sequoia Ecological Consulting for El Dorado Resource Conservation District in February 2021. This project includes 1,500 acres of public and private land proposed for treatment. The goal of the project is to reduce fuel loads, enhance community protection against wildfires, and increase the health and resiliency of forest stands. The treatment will be a combination of thinning, chipping and mastication of brush and smaller trees, and hand treatments, including brush cutting, hand thinning, and pruning. These are proposed to reduce vegetative density in selected stands and to change the structure of live and dead vegetative material. The training will address sensitive resource avoidance and general best management practices, or BMPs, which apply to the project in accordance with state and federal law and with the project's plans, specifications, and contract documents. All personnel working on the project, including subcontractors, will be required to review this training prior to beginning work. This project is located in the Wildland Urban Interface. The WUI is the area where human homes border the edges of wildlands. In order to protect these sensitive areas, fuels reduction managers have identified defense zones and threat zones. Defense zones are generally the area up to a quarter mile out from communities, which are associated with higher densities of residences, commercial buildings, and other facilities. Threat zones generally extend approximately one and a quarter miles out beyond the defense zones. The borders of defense and threat zones are determined following national, regional, and forest policy, and their locations help inform fuels protection activities, such as fuels management. Fuel treatments in wildland urban interface are designed to reduce the spread of and intensity of potential wildfires. Local fire management specialists determine the extent, treatment orientation, and prescription for the WUI based on the area's fire history, local fuel conditions, historical weather patterns, topography, and access. Fuels management and mechanical thinning treatment is designed in accordance with the design criteria detailed in the Sierra Nevada framework, which is a comprehensive forest management plan for the Sierra Nevada area. This environmental training will cover the regulatory framework surrounding our project, sensitive resources which have potential to occur in the project, best management practices, and the environmental training sign-in. Federal, state, and local laws, as well as contractor or agency policies, provide for the protection of wildlife and natural resources. Some laws include substantial fines and penalties. These include the Federal Endangered Species Act, the California State Endangered Species Act, the California Environmental Quality Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, California Fish and Game Code, and the U.S. Forest Service Rules and Policies. Section 9 of the Federal Endangered Species Act prohibits the take of endangered or threatened species without special exemption. To take is defined in the law as to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, or collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. To harm is further clarified in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service language to include significant habitat modification or degradation that results in the death or injury of a listed species. These activities are punishable by fines of up to $100,000 and or imprisonment for up to a year. Critical habitat for threatened and endangered species are specific geographic areas designated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that have their own protections from impacts and degradation. The California Endangered Species Act is similar to the Federal Endangered Species Act, but it is regulated by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. There are designated California state threatened or endangered species, but the state does not designate critical habitat. Species in California may be designated as a species of special concern, which means that they are at risk of becoming threatened or endangered. Approximately 250 species are currently listed in California as either threatened or endangered. Penalties for violation of the California Endangered Species Act can include fines of up to $50,000 and or up to one year of imprisonment. Pictured on the right is a foothill yellow-legged frog, which is a California endangered species and a forest service sensitive species. 
The California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, requires public agencies to thoroughly review new projects for potential impacts, including impacts to noise pollution, air and water quality, culturally and biologically sensitive resources, and aesthetic impacts to the public. This review process requires projects to either fully avoid impacts or to mitigate significant impacts to resources. CDFW works with the California Native Plant Society to maintain lists and designate plant species within a California rare plant rank, which are assessed during the CEQA review. The California Fish and Game Code also regulates projects such as the Fire Adapted 50 project. The Native Plant Protection Act preserves and protects 64 plant species, subspecies, and varieties, which are endangered or are rare native plants. Take of these species is prohibited without prior notification to CDFW. The National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, is similar to CEQA, but applies to projects that are, occur in federal jurisdiction, such as on federal property. California projects may undergo either CEQA or NEPA, or undergo both, or be exempted from both, depending on the location, jurisdiction, and project activity. NEPA establishes policies, goals, and means for carrying out policy for protection of the environment. It also requires environmental review of large projects. The Forest Service Sensitive Species Program includes material that informs forest management practices to ensure that species do not become threatened or endangered because of Forest Service or Forest Service approved actions. The Forest Service has a designated list of species for each national forest called Forest Service Sensitive and these may require special management. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act, administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, regulates migratory birds and their nests. This law states that it is unlawful to pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill, attempt to take a capture or kill, offer for sale, sell, offer for purchase, purchase, deliver for shipment, ship, cause to be shipped, deliver for transportation, transport, cause to be transported, carry, or cause to be carried by any means whatsoever, receive for shipment, transportation, or carriage, or export at any time or in any manner, any migratory bird, or any part, nest, or egg of such bird. In other words, we must not disturb native migratory birds, their nests, and their eggs. Active nests are those containing at least one egg or a young bird. For birds of prey, nests are considered active regardless of the presence of eggs or young. Nests are also protected under the California Fish and Game Code, which prohibits the disturbance of any na na native migratory nests, birds, or their eggs. There are several laws that apply to the protection of wetlands and waterways in California. The Federal Clean Water Act regulates the discharges of pollutants and obstruction of flow to waterways, wetlands, and tributaries in the United States. The California Fish and Game Code, Section 1602, requires that CDFW be notified prior to the beginning of any activity that may divert or obstruct the natural flow of, change the bed, channel, or bank of, use material from, or deposit any material into a river, stream, or lake in California. Forest practice rules also include guidance that are in compliance with CEQA, the Water Quality Act, and the Endangered Species Act, which were developed to assist foresters in complying with these regulations when performing timber harvest plans within California forest districts. Prevention of the spread of invasive species is an increasingly common concern across the United States. An executive order within the National Environmental Protection Act prompted the Forest Service to create the Invasive Species Management Program, which requires contractors to make every effort to prevent the accidental spread of invasive species carried by contaminated vehicles, equipment, personnel, or materials. The Forest Service Manual also includes guidelines to prevent the spread of invasive species. Pictured on the right is Scotch Broom, a very common and invasive species that may be encountered in or near work areas. Cultural resources are protected by the Antiquities Act of 1906 and the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. 
These protect cultural resources and require federal agencies to assess the effects of any agency-sponsored undertaking on cultural resources. It is a felony punishable by imprisonment to obtain, possess, or willfully destroy Native American remains or associated grave goods. It is a misdemeanor for any person other than a landowner to injure or destroy objects of historical or archaeological interest or value located on public or private lands. Native American human remains and any items associated with Native American burials that are encountered during project-related ground-disturbing activities must be treated in accordance with the recommendations of the appointed most likely descendant. Sensitive resources with potential to occur in the project area include nesting birds, threatened and endangered species, other sensitive species, sensitive natural communities such as lava cap habitats, rare plants, cultural resources, and water resources. Nesting birds are expected to occur in the work area. Birds utilize a variety of habitats and construct nests from many different types of materials. For example, the Anna's hummingbird pictured here constructs their nests out of cobwebs and lichen. Black Phoebes use mud and sticks. Acorn woodpeckers use existing cavities in trees, and hawks, such as the red-tailed hawk, use sticks to construct large nests. If nests or eggs are discovered within the vegetation removal area, stop work and contact the qualified biologist. Biologists will determine if species fall under the protection of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and will determine steps to avoid disturbance. As shown in these photos, bird nests can also occur on the ground hidden in tall grass, under the eaves or other parts of buildings and structures, within sock-like pendulum structures built by birds, or within stick nests in dense vegetation. The California spotted owl is a California state species of special concern. There is an ongoing lawsuit regarding their federal status, but they are not currently federally threatened or endangered. The species is expected to become listed in the coming years, so most ma managers recommend designing projects to protect them as if they were already listed as threatened or endangered. The spotted owl is a medium-sized chocolate-covered owl with white spots on the chest and belly area. They have dark eyes, no ear tufts, and a barred tail. Female spotted owls are generally larger than males. Their facial discs are dark brown with pale marks forming an X between the eyes. Spotted owls can be misidentified as barred owls, a species which is not native to California and is directly contributing to their decline. If these owls are seen near a worksite, please inform the biologist for further investigation. The California spotted owl subspecies is limited to the Sierra Nevada, spanning north into the southern Cascade Range in Shasta County and south into Kern County, and discontinuously throughout the mountains of Southern California. Spotted owls inhabit forests characterized by dense canopy closure of old growth trees, logs, standing snags, and living trees with broken tops. Although known to rest and forage in several different hab habitat types, these owls prefer multi-layered canopies with enough space for them to navigate between branches. Typically, forests do not obtain these characteristics until 150 to 200 years of succession. The spotted owl mostly hunts at night for small mammals such as wood rats, flying squirrels, deer mice, and voles, but have been documented feeding on birds and insects as well. They prefer to nest in sheltered sites and do little in the way of nest construction. They usually use old stick nests, or make a simple scrape in the cavity of a large tree. Young fledge the nest after about five weeks, 
but still require the care and supervision of the parents. Next, we have the California red-legged frog. This is a federally threatened species listed since 1996 and is also a California state species of special concern. The California red-legged frog is distributed through 26 counties in California. Their range has been reduced by 70% in California. They're find, found primarily in permanent and temporary water sources such as ponds, streams, drainage, lakes, and marshes. They will also use upland habitat within one to two miles of these wet breeding sites. The red-legged frog is most common in lowlands and foothills. The red-legged frog breeds from late November through April in waterways which are adjacent to riparian or emergent vegetation, including cattails, tules, or overhanging willows. Red-legged frog are active during the day all year, except in wetlands that dry out in the summer. These raptor species are protected by law and may occur within the project boundaries. The northern goshawks nests in steep slopes, coniferous forests with large trees and open understories. Northern goshawk is not expected to be nesting in or near our project areas, but it is known to occur nearby, so we should be aware that they may occur and be careful to avoid potential nests. Bald eagle are a California fully protected species and are also protected by the Federal Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. The bald eagle nests are extremely large and noticeable and typically are built along the margins of lakes and riparian areas. One pair of bald eagles is known to nest near Jenkinson Lake. Bald eagles are not expected to nest within our project boundary, but they are known to be nearby. If these or other raptor species exhibit signs that they may be nesting within our project boundary, such as carrying nesting material, acting agitated, or returning regularly to the same location, please inform the project forester or biologist so that they can investigate further. Lava cap habitats are a rare soil type found only in portions of the Sierra Nevada, including the El Dorado National Forest and the surrounding area. These are ridges formed by prehistoric volcanic mud flows and centuries of erosion. They appear to be open rocky areas, typically on ridge tops or on ridge ends within the forest. 
For most of the, the year, they appear to be bare, rocky areas of grassland or mixed chaparral. During the springtime, they are often colored, covered by a colorful display of rare wildflowers. These areas support communities of annual herbs, perennial shrubs, and dwarf tree species characterized by diverse species of rare wildflowers. These are extremely fragile habitats that are subject to erosion and compaction when disturbed. They are threatened by road development and trail development, invasive plants, and fields reduction activities and drought. These areas do not support large trees or thick brush, so they will not be targeted by work activities. Several rare plants have the potential to occur in our project area. For a quick background, California rare plants are ranked on a system maintained by the California Native Plant Society, or CNPS. Plants are given a ranking from list 1A, which are extinct species, to list 4, which are species with a limited distribution. The plants we will discuss here are all California rare plant ranking 1B, which is the most sensitive rating that is not considered extinct. Sawtooth Lewisia on the left is a California rare plant ranking 1B1. It's also forest service sensitive and a California species of special concern. Sawtooth Lewisia blooms in May and June and grows in rocky outcrops and riparian scrub in woodland, yellow pine forest, and mixed evergreen forest. On the right, we have the Pleasant Valley Mariposa Lily, which is a California rare plant ranking 1B2. It's also a forest service sensitive species. This beautiful flower blooms from May to July and grows in open oak and yellow pine forests. This species is associated with lava cap communities. Nissanin manzanita is a CNPS list 1v2 species and is endemic to California, meaning it is only found in California. It is also a forest service sensitive species. This species blooms in February and March and grows on open rock shale ridges in chaparral and woodland habitats. It can be difficult to distinguish from other manzanita species. On the right, we have the Red Hill soap root, which is a CNPS 1B2 species and is forest service sensitive. This species blooms in May and June and grows in serpentine outcrops, open shreddy or wooded hills in chaparral, foothill woodland, and yellow pine forests. Sensitive cultural resources also have the potential to occur in our project area. These are material byproducts of human activity, which can be physical objects, sites, and structures, such as grinding stones, bowls, obsidian, or chert flakes, or shell beads. They could also be potential burial sites, such as bones and human remains, or mines and adits or shafts. Cultural resources are significant in helping us understand our shared human history, and they're non-renewable meaning once they are destroyed, a fragment of our collective history is lost forever. Riparian resources and water bodies have the potential to occur in our project area as well. This includes all rivers, streams, creeks, ponds, lakes, all water bodies in adjacent to the work area. For the purposes of protection, waterways are categorized into three classes with different protections. Class one is fish bearing streams. Class two support aquatic life and typically flow year round, while class three are intermittent streams and they do not support aquatic life. All streams and riparian vegetation will be protected through implementation of the forest practice rules on private land, and they'll be protected through the decision criteria on forest service land. Best Management Practices, or BMPs, encompass all required and recommended guidance related to the various regulations controlling a project. Several types of surveys will be conducted in order to inform the implementation of our best management practices. General pre-activity surveys will be conducted at all sites that do not require a specific pre-implementation survey. These will be conducted by a biologist, a registered professional forester, or a cultural resource specialist prior to the start of work. The purpose of these surveys is to flag off sensitive resources that require avoidance, including lava cap habitats, 
riparian resources, noxious weeds, areas that are susceptible to erosion, or any other sensitive resources that may be present. Specialized avian surveys may be required at work areas that occur within California Spotted Owl Protected Activity Centers or where spotted owl nesting is suspected. The purpose of these surveys is to flag off protective nesting buffers around active California spotted owl nest sites, which will meet the requirements of CEQA and the California Endangered Species Act. It should be noted that active migratory bird nests may be encountered during general pre-activity surveys. At any time, if an active migratory bird nest is located, a no-activity buffer should be established and flagged around that active nest. Red-legged frog visual encounter surveys may be conducted in areas within a mile of suitable breeding habitat within the community of pine steel break. These will be conducted by a biologist to determine whether red-legged frogs are present or absent within the one-mile buffer of the suitable breeding pond. If no frogs are found, red-legged frogs are assumed to be absent in the area and no LOP or limited operating period will be used. If red-legged frogs are detected, the following limited operating period will be used. No work will occur during and after any precipitation event that delivers a quarter inch or more of rain when it occurs between October 15th through April 15th. Work can occur during the summer months from April 16th through October 14th without any LOP restrictions. During this project, most impacts to botanical resources will be completely avoided by staying out of areas which contain sensitive habitat, such as lava cap habitats. Botanical surveys may still be required in parts of the active work area where there is potential for sensitive plants to occur. In these areas, botanical surveys will be conducted by a registered professional forester or botanist whose qualifications may be reviewed by the Forest Service at request. The purpose of these surveys is to map and flag sensitive plant populations so that the crew may avoid them during work. Cultural surveys. Culturally sensitive resource surveys have already been completed at all work areas. If sensitive resources were not flagged by the archaeologist during this initial survey, a registered professional forester will use the maps the archaeologist created during their survey to flag resources for avoidance during the general pre-activity survey. Cultural resource surveys were conducted by archaeologists in all work areas in order to create maps of sensitive resources for flagging and avoidance. Best management practices, or BMPs, are specific to a project. They combine all required and recommended guidance related to the various regulations controlling the project. They're practices that reduce the impacts of the project on the public and environment. These may reduce noise disturbance, pollution into nearby waterways, potential impacts to sensitive wildlife or cultural resources, aesthetic values of the neighbors, or other concerns. There are guidelines that help us operate within the legal bounds of all regulations and laws. Some BMPs are legally binding and help us to avoid costly fines. Some BMPs help us maintain trust and cooperation within our community, property owners, and agencies. BMPs help us to comply with the environmental and other laws that apply to our project. Nesting birds. In order to comply with all laws related to the protection of birds, all personnel will receive nesting bird awareness training. Before work at each new site, a pre-activity survey will be conducted to determine the presence of nesting birds, 
and protective buffer zones will be established and maintained around all active bird nests. Pre-activity surveys are very important to identify new nesting birds. For example, this photo shows a morning dove nest which was built in the tread of a backhoe while the equipment was idle. It's important to check equipment, tall vegetation, and structures for new nests each day when work occurs during the nesting season. The forester or biologist will inform the crew of the nest status or whether the nest is active and describe steps to avoid impacts. This may include establishment of a nest buffer. A nest buffer is a protected area around the nest within which work will not occur until after the nest has fledged or the chicks have flown away. California red-legged frog has different best management practices depending on the conditions of the habitat in the work area. Some mastication restrictions apply in areas near suitable red-legged frog breeding habitat. A biologist will conduct a field assessment of riparian resources within one mile of work areas prior to the start of work. The survey will determine whether the ponds are suitable breeding habitat for red-legged frog. If the survey finds that the areas do provide suitable breeding habitat, the following mastication restrictions will apply. Mastication will not occur within a 300 foot buffer around red-legged frog aquatic breeding habitat. Mastication will not occur within a 300 foot buffer of all perennial streams or special aquatic features located within one mile of aquatic breeding habitat and it will not occur within a 150 foot buffer around intermittent or ephemeral streams located within one mile of aquatic breeding habitat. This buffer may be reduced by the biologist depending on the results of the pre-activity survey. The California red-legged frog rain events BMP applies when work is occurring from October 15th through April 15th and when work is occurring during and after any precipitation event that delivers a quarter inch or more of rain. When these qualifications are met, a limited operating period, or LOP, shall apply, prohibiting the use of mastication equipment, pile burning, and prescribed burning within one mile of any red-legged frog breeding habitat. These activities will be allowed to resume after a 72-hour drying period. The BMP would not apply to location where pre-implementation surveys of potential breeding habitat find no evidence of red-legged frog occupancy or breeding. Special California red-legged frog BMPs apply within the species critical habitat. Critical habitat is an area of the species range which has been determined critical for the species survival. This designation was created by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for species which are listed as threatened or endangered. Within our project area, portions of the Fly Park region south of Highway 50 fall within red-legged frog critical habitat. In these areas, all mastication work within red-legged frog critical habitat ELD1 subunit would take place during the summer drying period, which is from June 15th through September 30th, when intermittent or ephemeral streams are most likely to be dry and red-legged frog are most likely to be in or near aquatic habitats. In order to protect unique plant communities, lava cap habitat areas will be demarcated with flagging stakes or something similar prior to the initiation of work. No mechanical ground disturbing activities will occur within the demarcated areas. All project-related equipment and vehicles shall remain on existing road corridors within the lava caps, including no parking off-road, heavy equipment travel, etc. 
Cultural resources also need to be protected in the project area. Should any previously unrecorded cultural resources be encountered during implementation of the project, all work in that area shall cease within 50 feet of the cultural resource as soon as practicable, and an archaeologist shall be notified. Work may resume if approved by archaeologists subject to implementation of additional protection measures. Any known cultural resource sites found within the project area will be flagged in advance of operations and avoided during project implementation. All contractors shall meet applicable regulatory requirements to ensure that any discharges to surface waters will not cause violation to the state water quality standards. On U.S. Forest Service land, heavy equipment is limited within 15 feet of any water course. The following measures are recommended for work on private land. Heavy equipment is limited within 25 feet of Class 3 waterways, 50 feet of Class 2 waterways, and 75 feet of Class 1 waterways. These distances may be adjusted appropriately to address steepness and length of slope above the waterway, safety, or other concerns, as addressed in the forest practice regulations. Whether on private or public land, the zone of protection shall be clearly identified on the ground with paint, flagging, or other suitable means prior to the start of work. No equipment operations will be permitted within these zones. In addition, no drafting of water from natural water courses is permitted. If needed, water breaks will be installed at spacing as prescribed by the forest practice rules on any areas that are compacted due to equipment operations. The contractor is required to remove processed materials from roadside ditches where it impedes flow or any water conveyance systems. During the pre-activity survey at each project site, Areas of known infestations of invasive plant species will be flagged for avoidance. If project activities cannot be completely avoided within the flagged infestation areas, strategies to prevent the spread of infestation will be employed, including working in the infested area last, working in the infested areas when propagules are not viable, or in other words, when the plant does not contain reproductive parts, such as the spiky seed filled bud of a yellow star thistle pictured on the right. Uh, crews shall limit the number of people or equipment within the infestation, and crews can clean mechanical and hand equipment, clothing, and boots, etc. after leaving the infested area. In addition, the following practices shall be implemented. Off-road equipment shall be cleaned to ensure it is free of soils, seeds, vegetative matter, or other debris to prevent the introduction or spread of invasive plants. And slash will be chipped into flagged infestation areas, if possible, near the work area. The project may be conducted during the winter operating period. The winter operating period applies to work that occurs between November 15th and April 15th. If work occurs during this time, the following BMPs apply. Heavy equipment cannot be used under saturated soil conditions. 
no equipment operations will be permitted on slopes greater than 45% or less if erosion hazard rating is high or extreme or if the slope is continuous to a water course. And mechanized mastication equipment shall be prohibited on saturated soils when there is a risk of detrimental compaction or rutting. To prevent exposure to smoke, dust, and fumes, contractors may have to prepare storm water erosion control plans. Dust abatement measures, including watering, will be implemented at the direction of the supervising forester. No visible dust transport will be permitted outside of project boundaries, and all equipment will conform to California emission standards. The following BMPs apply to public safety, noise, and other optics. Warning signs shall be posted in work areas to alert oncoming traffic and recreational users. All equipment will meet or exceed the state standards for noise control. Hours of operation will be limited to 7 a.m. through 6 p.m., Monday through Saturday. Vehicle speeds will be limited to 15 miles per hour on dirt roads and surfaces. Where mastication is employed, the maximum depth of masticated material will not exceed 6 inches. And the maximum stump height on cut trees will not exceed 4 inches on the uphill side. Before beginning fuels reduction activities, all contractor personnel are required to attend an environmental training program. The training program will be completed in person or by watching a video presented by the project biologist. Be sure to sign the sign-in sheet at the end of this training to assist in tracking. Please reach out to the project contacts listed here with any questions. Thank you for your time.